everybody. Welcome back to Measure Theoretic Probability. In today's video, we're going to be talking about tail sigma fields, or equivalently, tail sigma algebras, and Kolmogorov's zero-one law. So overarching everything, as usual, we have a probability space. We have a non-empty set omega. We have a sigma field curly F consisting of subsets of omega with nice properties. And we have a probability measure P that takes in sets in curly F and spits out numbers between zero and one. I'm not going to keep saying that as usual. That is implicit in every definition and theorem I want to talk about today. Let's jump right in with the definition of a tail sigma field. Consider a sequence of sets, A1, A2, A3, etc., from the underlying sigma field. I want to consider a sigma field that can be built out of sort of the end of this sequence, no matter when you start looking. In particular, I'm going to define a tail sigma field. I'm going to call it curly F sub capital T. And I'm going to define it to be the intersection of sigma fields of the form an, an plus one, an plus two on up. And I'm going to hopefully make that a little more intuitive for you in a moment with examples. But this is another sigma field by definition. It's the sigma field generated by uh, these events and intersections of sigma fields. We saw it was another sigma field. And events in the tail sigma field are known as tail events. So what does a tail event look like? Let's take any event or set A from the tail sigma field. That means it's in this intersection, which means it's in this sigma field for every n equals 1, 2, 3 on up. In particular, it's in the sigma field generated by A1, A2, A3 on up. And that means that it can be, the event A can be built out of the events A2, A3, A4 on up. You can form it using complements and countable intersections and countable unions of all of those events. But because A is in this intersection, it's also in the sigma field over here when N is 2. And that means it can be built from the events A2, A3, A4 on up. So it's kind of like you don't need A1 after all. And continuing in this manner, looking at the intersection, for any positive integer capital N, A is in the sigma field generated by A sub capital N on up. And that means that it can be built from the events A sub capital N on up. So it's kind of like a limit, like out outside of the context of measure theory, if you have a limit of a sequence of real numbers, you can drop the first n of them and your limit is not going to change. And we can generalize these statements here. You can actually drop any finite number. It doesn't have to be from the beginning because eventually your intersection index is going to pass the highest subscript in your collection of sets that you want to drop. So again, with the limits and real numbers, if you have a sequence of real numbers, you can pull out any finite collection of that sequence and the limit will still be the same. Back to measure theory, let's look at some examples. Consider a sequence A1, A2, A3, etc. from the underlying sigma field, and I'm going to let F sub capital T be the tail sigma field that we have just defined. For my first example, I want you to suppose that the ANs are increasing to a set or event A. I claim that this set A is going to be in the tail sigma field. So as a reminder, what an increasing to a, this northeast arrow means, is that we have sets a1 contained in a2, contained in a3, and we keep expanding. And the limit set a is formed by taking the union of all of these sets. So because of this nesting property here, we know that a is the union of all of these sets, but I can knock out the first set, I can knock out the second set, I can knock out any of the sets on the inside. The union of this increasing contain sequence is going to be the same. In other words, this limit A as the union of all of these is the union of as n goes from m to infinity for any m greater than or equal to 1. And that means that A is formed out of the events a m, a m plus 1 on up for any m greater than or equal to 1. So it's in the sigma field generated by those sets. But since this holds for any m greater than or equal to 1, the set A is in the intersection of all of those sigma fields and therefore in the tail sigma field. That wasn't too bad. For my second example, I'm going to leave this one to you. I think you would maybe guess what's coming next. If the, we have a collection of sets A and that are decreasing to a set A, then I claim that A is in the tail sigma field generated by those sets. So again, I'm leaving this one for you. It is very similar to what we just did and very quick and easy to show. 
Okay, so for a third example, let's suppose that the events A1, A2, A3 on up from the underlying sigma field F are just sort of general. They're not necessarily increasing or decreasing. I claim that the limb soup of the sequence of sets is in the tail sigma field. You'll recall that we define this as the intersection as n goes from 1 to infinity of the union as m goes from n to infinity of the am. We've already proven this because consider this set over here, this union, as n changes. So the first union we have is the union as m goes from 1 to infinity. The second union is the union as m goes from 2 to infinity. So that is contained in the first union. And as m goes from 3 to infinity, that's a smaller set contained in the second union. And so really here, we're looking at a decreasing sequence of sets, and they're decreasing to the intersection. So the intersection of this sequence of sets is the ultimate A, but that's how we define the limb soup. So A for this problem is the limb soup, and we are done by example two. You know what's coming next, the limb imp. I'm also going to leave this one for you. This is going to be a very similar process to what we just did. I claim for any arbitrary sequence of sets in the sigma field, the limb inf is in the sigma field. So all you need to do is write down the definition of the limb inf and focus in on the um, intersections within the unions. And as we increase the index, we are intersecting from 1 to infinity, intersecting from 2 to infinity. We're getting smaller and smaller. You're looking at a union of a decreasing sequence of sets. And so we know that result is in the tail sigma field if you prove example two in this list of examples. It's time for Kolmogorov's zero one law. Let's suppose we have a sequence of independent events, A1, A2, A3 on up from the underlying sigma field. Then for any event A in the tail sigma field generated by these events, we must have that the probability that A occurs is either zero or one. This sounds familiar, almost like borel cantelli 2, where we had a specific example. We saw in the borel cantelli lemma 2 that the limb soup set of a sequence, in the case that the sum of the probability measures of the individual sets is infinite, and the sequence is uh, are, are of independent sets, we saw that the probability of the limb soup was one there. And I'm saying now that this probability is always going to be one or zero if we have independence and the event we're looking at is in the tail sigma field. So Burrell Cantelli is sort of a special case here, although it's actually its own thing and a pretty strong theorem in its own right because the Kolmogorov zero one law does not tell you whether you get zero or one, and it's generally pretty hard to figure out which one of those you're going to get. At this point, I wouldn't blame you if you thought that the probability of all limb soup sets is zero or one, but that is not the case. And to get an example, we need to remove independence. So here is a concocted, really easy example. Let's take any event A in the underlying sigma field that has a probability measure that is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than one. So let's call this maybe little p. I'm going to define a really boring sequence. I'm going to let a1 be the set a, I'm going to let a2 be the set a, I'm going to let a3 be the set a, and so on. So the sum of the individual probability measures, this is just the sum of p and p and p and p, and, p, and this is diverging because it's not going down to zero, which is you know a necessary but not sufficient condition for convergence of this sum. So we do know this sum is infinite because I'm just summing one number over and over and over again. Even though it's small, it's not going away. Now, the limb soup of this sequence, if you write that out as the intersection of the union, um, A, 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 you know, the union of any number of the A's is just A again. And the intersection of any number of the A's is just A again. So it's, it's easy to see that the limb soup set here is just A again. But by design, the probability measure of A was strictly between zero and one, so here is an example of the limb soup set having a probability measure between zero and one. Kind of silly, but it makes the point. Let's prove Kolmogorov zero one law. As a reminder, we have independent events, and for any event A in the tail sigma field generated by those events, we must have the probability measure of A to be either zero or one. So to start, you'll recall from the previous video, we had something called new theorem two. And this said that if you have independent events, A1, A2, A3 on up, 
that the event A1 is independent of the sigma field generated by the remaining events A2, A3, A4 on up. In fact, we know that A1 is independent of the sigma field generated by any collection AN, AN plus 1, and so on on up. All you need to do is take your original sequence and just completely remove the A2 through AN minus 1. Now you have a sequence A1, AN, AN plus 1. You're starting with an independent sequence of sets, and you can use new theorem 2. In other words, we're just playing with indices here. Slightly more generally than this, I claim that you can just keep extending this and that the events A1, A2, up through AN minus 1 are independent of the sigma field generated by the rest of the sets, AN, AN plus 1 on up. A very similar result, and it's a corollary of our new theorem too. So take any event A in the tail sigma field generated by these independent events. Then we know that A is in the sigma field generated by the tail sequence AN, AN plus 1, on up for every N greater than or equal to 1. But by the claim I just made at the end of the previous slide, this means that A is independent of A1, A2, up through AN minus 1 for any N greater than or equal to 1. Because these events are independent of this sigma field, and A is an event out of this sigma field. And that's how you would show these events are independent of this sigma field. You would take something from the sigma field and look at these events and all the intersections. Because A is independent of this finite sequence, no matter what N is, that's how we define independence for infinite sequences. We can now say that A is independent of the entire sequence or the entire collection of sets, A1, A2, A3, A4, on up. So by applying our new theorem number two, again, we now know that A is independent of the sigma field generated by A1, A2, A3, on up. Oh, but wait, A was in the tail sigma field. So because it's in this intersection, it is in particular in the first sigma field here. Being in this intersection means that A is in the sigma field generated by A1, A2, A3, on up. But we just, we just determined that A is independent of all of these and A is in there, A is independent of everything in here, and A is in here. That means that A is independent of itself. So the probability of A intersect A is equal to the probability of A times the probability of A. This probability of A intersect A is just the probability of A, and this, of course, is the probability of A squared. And the only way to have a number equal to its square is to have the number be 0 or 1. And we're done. We have proven that the probability that A occurs, a general event taken from the tail sigma field, is either 0 or 1. We have proven Kolmogorov's 0-1 law. As I mentioned, it is usually very difficult, if not impossible, to determine, in, certainly in general, you cannot determine whether Kolmogorov's 0-1 law is going to give you the 0 or the 1. And for a particular sequence of sets, it may be very hard. Sometimes you can figure out which one it is. I think I should give you more examples, but I'm going to hold off because our greatest examples, I believe, for Kolmogorov's 0-1 law are in determining convergence for sequences of random variables. We haven't talked about random variables at all. That's coming up next if you return random variables. Hope to see you in the next one.